Okay. Hello? Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. Tasia's sister um, will be here in a minute, I'm sure. <laughs> She'll rush in and we'll all turn around and say hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Trish Murphy, the founding editor of the online literary magazine Superstition Review. And on behalf of my department in the School of Letters and Sciences, we're so proud to bring you Tej Bolin for this presentation, Superheroes in Narrative, Comics Come of Age in Print and Film. And before I introduce Tej, I just want to thank all of you who came today. We're really happy to see you. And I hope you'll go to superstitionreview.com and check out our magazine. We're currently accepting applications for summer interns and fall trainees. And you can find that information on our blog. And thanks also to all of my fabulous interns who advertised this talk and who are doing a fantastic job putting together our issue 11. So thank you very much, interns, for being here. And those who aren't here, thank you, too, because you've worked very hard. Uh, thanks to Mike Mader, Assistant Dean of Students, for his help putting together the event, and Kayla, who made the beautiful flyer. And thanks also to Neil Lester of Project Humanities for including us in his week-long celebration of superheroes. When Neil told me the theme of this year's Project Humanities Week, I immediately knew what I was going to do. I was going to bring Tej to Arizona. I've known Tej for about 20 years now. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. And I know a weakness of his. <laughs> or should I say a, uh, um, a skill. Um, Tej has worked as a pop culture writer for Village Voice Media, writing stories as diverse as seven celebrity chefs that would make great zombies, <laughs> to seven things non-geeks should know about Iron Man. <laughs> in addition to his pop culture chops, Tej is also an expert in literary fiction. He is currently assistant professor of creative writing at the University of Colorado, Denver, where he also serves as faculty advisor for the student newspaper, The Advocate. His fiction has both most recently been seen in South Dakota Review and Hawaii Pacific Review and also in Superstition Review. We were very happy to have some of his pieces in our last issue, issue 10. Uh, his first novel, The Pull of the Earth, won the Colorado Book Award for fiction. And he's currently finishing up a college survival guide called Snarktastic, a second novel, and a collection of flash fiction and photography. And Tej, thank you so much for making the trek down from Colorado. I want to give you this Superstition Review coffee mug. <laughs> thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm going to go wireless. Is everybody okay with that? Am I breaking anyone's eardrums? No, you're all good. Cool. Um, thank you very much, all, everyone, for coming. Uh, thanks, Trish, for bringing me out. Um, and thanks to uh, Superstition Review for not only an awesome magazine, but for participating in this process. Very cool. I just want to take a moment, uh, because this is sort of a, 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 a <laughs> an event for me. I've been reading comic books since I was a very small kid, and it never occurred to me that at some point in my life someone was going to invite me to another state to come and talk about them. <laughs> so I just want us all to respect the moment, just for a minute, because this is, yeah, let <laughs> me take a breath. It's good. It's a good day. Um, so I want to talk mainly about narrative today in terms of the comic books, and you'll have to bear with me because I'm uh, with the with the PowerPoint, I'm going to do my best with the clicker and the technology available to me. But um, uh, this should work great. Um, narrative in comic books uh, is uh, paramount. I would argue that's going to be like the central thesis. It's an artistic medium, and it depends on the drawing and the amazing um, and active art of the medium to really work. But narrative uh, story. Is, is absolutely paramount in the medium. And I think that one of the things that I actually discovered in, in putting this, this talk together is just how paramount it's become. It's, it's uh, the, the rise and the fall of the comic book as a medium is actually pretty closely tied to how good the stories are 
in, the, in that medium. And so that's one of the things that I want to trace with you today is to go back to the very beginning of this medium and go through and show you where um, stories were advancing, how story was advancing, um, and where narrative really started to break down, where narrative really started to become either scarce or in some way just really just not good. Um, and there are a number of different reasons for that, and we'll look at those as we move forward. Um, I, have, I have Trish on uh, Tangent Watch, because as, as, I, as I put this together, I found myself, you can see in my notes, I've got big red X's, where <laughs> these are really cool facts that have nothing to do with what I'm talking about today, but that I had to write down because they're so awesome. So if I get off on, on a tangent, just wave your hands at me or something. Um, so, uh, narrative. The, 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 the beginning of the comic book actually started back in the late 30s um, with two of the, the holy grails of collecting. You've got Action Comics number one and Detective Comics number 27. Uh, and you can see 1938 and 1939. This is really where the the medium began, uh, essentially. There have been superheroes and superhero type characters before this, um, mostly in pulp magazines, pulp novels, um, but, but this is where the, the, the superhero as we know it today, the superhero as we um, conceive of it today, began. Um, just, just to give you an idea of how big these things are, this is my sister, everybody. Everybody clap for my sister. Who, who wore a superhero shirt. Um, so, just to give you an idea of how important these are to narrative today, this comic book right here sold for over $2 million in 2011 for one comic book. That's insane. Even for me, who wants that comic book very badly, that's crazy. Uh, and, but it shows how important these... these uh, things have become, this medium has become, not only in terms of collectability, which is a big part of it, but, uh, but also in terms of how important they are to modern culture. Uh, one of the things that I think is amazing for uh, comic books as they move forward, as it moves forward, and as we develop away from some of these negatives that we'll talk about today in the medium, is that they, 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 really, they really are a uniquely American art form. We invented this. We as, as, as a nation invented this medium by, by and large. Um, we've be definitely, as Americans, been at the forefront of its development, its rise, its fall, several times. Um, all right, a couple of things about uh, the early superhero as a figure. The early superhero as a figure was not what we think it was uh, it was. The, we have this romanticized vision of Superman, for example, as this sort of very, very strong uh, sort of Boy Scout character. He's always doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Um, a, a kind of goody two-shoes character. This is an early strip uh, in one of the early comic books where Superman honestly just goes crazy. He gets very angry. Superman got very angry a lot in the early days. Most of the comic books in the early action comics days were Superman going nuts. And he would, he would see something that was um, to him insufferable, like poverty in the, in the example behind me. This is Superman's reaction to poverty. He destroys everyone's houses. <laughs> he, he's angry because people are living in, in the slums and so in response to that he destroys the slums hand, just by hand. He goes through and destroys everything. And then you can see in that panel, he says, so the government rebuilds destroyed areas with modern cheap rental apartments. Yay. So I'm going to destroy everything. And that's so, so Superman's sort of dumb early on. He's a little simple. Uh, but, but he has uh, America's best uh, interest at heart. He, he does get very angry. In another, um, another strip, he gets angry because a friend of his is killed by a drunk driver. Uh, and so he goes out and starts destroying cars. Literally just goes out, he goes to car dealerships, destroys the cars there, he just gets very angry. And eventually he, someone says, hey Superman, calm down. <laughs> and, and he does. Um, but that's, that's the golden age, this, which is what this period is called, the golden age of the medium. Uh, that's, a lot of these characters were very, uh, very violent, 
very angry. They were, uh, they were very um, irrational at times. All right. So we've got World War II, which uh, obviously happens directly following the inception of the comic book. And World War II is important in this regard because uh, they were used primarily as, as propaganda tools. Um, in, for the war effort. Medics in World War II, this continued on into um, uh, Korea and Vietnam as well. Medics would carry comic books in their uh, packs to give to wounded soldiers, um, not only as sort of a, a measure of comfort, but also as uh, a sort of, some sort of proof that Amer the America that they had left behind was still in support of them. And so this leads us to very, very strong uh, propaganda uh, and these comics again these covers are very hard to find in the collectors because uh, it, it, for collectors because to modern eyes they're very racially insensitive the Superman um, uh, anti-Japanese war effort uh, on the right is is pretty famous these are this was propaganda this was war propaganda and comic books embraced that in a huge huge way it was one of the ways that they became so popular um, there were comic book exceptions to paper drives in World War II because the government recognized that this form of propaganda worked for um, American sentiment. And so when people were saying recycle everything, recycle everything, recycle everything, one of the exceptions that was often made was for comic books that were pro-war sentiments. Um, so World War II, huge in the comic book uh, arena, and it really set, uh, cemented this perception in the public, li public eye that comic books were a positive force, right? This is also, about this same time, is where these superheroes started to get really, really popular in terms of the public eye at large, um, instead of just uh, a kid-focused audience. Um, this is where the public, in general, started to really pay attention the thing that, the other thing that was indicative of this age, this golden age, was that the power levels were much more down to earth. Uh, Superman, for example, we, we think of Superman as being hugely, hugely powerful, um, but originally he could not fly. Superman could only leap about an eighth of a mile. Um, he was strong enough to lift a car or a small truck. That was about the limit of his strength. Uh, uh, as fast as a speeding express train, which is about 100 miles an hour generously. Uh, so also in vulnerability he was he, he, could, he could withstand an exploding artillery, anything short of uh, an art, uh, exploding artillery shell. So but there were things that could, that could hurt him back in the day. He, so he was he was uh, you know powerful but not so uber powerful that he could move a planet out of orbit that he could do all these things that he would do later on in his career when things got crazy. Um, likewise the other major heroes of the day, Captain America, who is not yet a Marvel superhero because Marvel didn't exist yet. Um, Captain America is just a guy, really, with a shield. He just sort of goes around punching Nazis. That was his thing. Um, and Batman clearly had no real powers at all early on. He was just a, a rich guy who had the wherewithal to have a lot of really cool toys and a ward. <laughs> that was it. That was his superpower. Um, the thing that people remember about the Golden Age, even fans, is that, like I said, there was this darkness inherent in these characters. The narratives showed these characters as um, somewhat flawed, but, e but, but more importantly, as, as angry and justifiably violent. That's key. Justifiable violence was very key to early narrative in superheroes. And so you have, um, you have these examples of, honestly, just these supposedly... Uh, supposed superhero good guys carrying guns, killing people at random. They were all people that deserved it, I grant you, but it's no longer, it's not what it would become later, which is the, that heroes have this sort of no killing rule, right? We've all heard this. The, and we'll get to this later on. This still exists today, even though we kind of regard it in modern narrative with sort of a wink. So we'll get, to the, we'll get there before we end today. But People will say Batman never, never carried a gun. That's not true. Batman carried lots of guns. Batman had planes with guns mounted on them. Um, and uh, Superman, likewise, was pretty, pretty violent. Uh, here he's threatening somebody uh, with a gun. 
um, threatening to shoot them. And over here, this is one of my favorites, where he's saying, run for your lives uh, if you don't want to be burned to a crisp. But Superman's starting that fire. <laughs> this, is, this is a fire that Superman's starting, and then he's like, oh, run. <laughs> Very heroic. Um, so some of this makes sense, because some of these characters are holdovers from, like I said, the pulp novels uh, of the... Um, of earlier times. And so these pulp novels would include characters like The Shadow. And Batman, er early on, is very much just a knockoff of The Shadow. Batman's not all that original a character. Um, the Shadow from um, the radio serials later on, The Shadow was actually survived as a character long after, or far into uh, Batman's inception. But Batman, by and large, was a, was a sort of a knockoff of the character of the Shadow. And the Shadow was just a guy in, dressed all in black with a, a big black hat. He was imposing. He scared criminals just by showing up. And he would carry a gun and he would shoot people if they were bad. That's pretty much the whole thing with the Shadow. Batman was just like that until a little bit later when they decided to make him a little more kid-friendly and, and give him a no-killing code like most of the other superheroes would have. Okay. This is my movie clip. This is one uh, the in uh, in this during this period of time, narratives were starting to interact with comic books in a very specific way. And and one of the things, one of my favorite examples of this is uh, from the movie uh, The Third Man uh, by Graham Greene. And this is a movie, uh, an Orson Welles movie. And in this movie, which uh, is um, replete with zither music and really great shots of Vienna. It's a beautiful movie. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Um, Orson Welles plays a character named Harry Lime. Harry Lime is very much this superhero kind of character. He disappears seemingly at will. He's always just skulking around here and there. He's very much like Batman. He's got um, he's the villain of the piece, but he's also um, very Batman-like. He disappears. He's got a bunch of money. He's got a ton of friends. He's got a lot of contacts that help him out. Um, and the, well, let me just play this, this bit and then we'll kind of explain what, I don't know how to, nope. Okay. Let me explain this clip. <laughs> In this, in this clip, he, it's, this, it's a very famous uh, um, scene uh, from The Third Man where he's, he's basically defending the nature of evil to his friend who has tried to find him, has finally found him in, in, in post-war Vienna. Um, and in this clip, Harry Lime is defending, is, is saying, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, it's a, it's a line that goes something like this. In... Uh, um, in Italy, under the Borgias, there were hundreds of years of, of terror and bloodshed and all these really bad things, right? Um, in, um, uh, what's the name of the country? In, uh, in another country, <laughs> Switzerland. In Switzerland, they had hundreds of years of peace and prosperity and, and brotherly love, and um, all they came up with was the cuckoo clock. That was, that's like the defense of evil. Under the Borgias, they had the Renaissance, and they had amazing works of art, suffering, creating positive things. This is the sort of defense of evil that, that Harry Lyme, as this sort of pseudo-Batman sort of character, uh, presents. This is very, very close to uh, what the Golden Age character tried to present in narrative. This, this end justifies the means. We must react violently to violent men. We must... You know, this, this was part of the, the, the heart of the narrative. Um, and there's a great scene in, uh, at the end of that scene where he, Harry Lyme delivers this speech and then uh, sort of uh, walks away, skulks away through a children's playground to escape, to get away, to make good his escape. Um, and I think that's a really strong metaphor visually for the way that the United States and, uh, and its society and especially um, the folks in power were starting to regard comic book narrative as this sort of power skulking around the, the playgrounds of its youth because it was a medium that we were starting not to trust um, for a number of different reasons. One of them was that the war was over and there was no need for propaganda anymore. Um, another one was that we were entering into a very conservative era just overall and Americans were starting to mistrust anything that might be misleading their youth. And that led us to, whoops, I already transitioned. That led us to 
the seduction of the innocent. This is Frederick Wortham's 1954 uh, book that um, really vilified comic books in a major, major way. Um, it, was, it was a response not only to the violence in comics, which was a big part of it, and we'll get to that in a second, but it also had a lot to do with the presumptive um, sexual content of comic books. Uh, and Wortham in his, in his book points to a number of different places where this takes place. In terms of superhero relationships, it, he um, specifically talks about Batman and Robin having a pseudo-homosexual relationship, which is absolutely not in the comics at all, but that's, that was the accusation. And that actually has cropped up. That's survived. That accusation has survived throughout the decades since. It comes back up as sort of, it's more of a joke now. Back then it was not a joke at all. He also talked at length about Wonder Woman being a kind of pseudo bondage character, um, which was actually that was totally true. That was just true. The 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 guy who invented Wonder Woman was was totally into that. So <laughs> that's that was a fair cop. But the rest of it, not so much. Um, and the selection of the innocent as a book really started to vilify comic books as a medium. This is the first gigantic blow to the medium, whereas where narrative was be, was really starting to ramp up and really starting to really reflect the larger culture in movies like The Third Man, for example, um, and and play with that uh, with that idea of the hero in media. This is where it all start, just gets stopped cold, right? It really starts. It really stops when the U.S. Senate has their um, their, uh, uh, their, their Senate hearings on juvenile delinquency. And uh, Senator Estes Kefauver calls up a number of people, one of whom is Bill Gaines. Bill Gaines was the uh, publisher of EC Comics, which was the leading comic book company at the time. Uh, at DC was, was still doing well with Superman and Batman, but EC was doing a lot of ho horror comics and crime comics some superhero stuff mixed in with, with that. Um, and this is a, just a, from the, the, the hearings that, that, um, that they had. Senator Kefauver says, here's your main issue, and that's, this is the issue he's referring to, crime suspense stories. This seems to be a man with a bloody ax holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. Do you think that's in good taste? Uh, and Bill Gaines, um, Bill Gaines, by the way, who was really angry at this process, he 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 felt as though this were, this, were a, this was a personal attack, and in some ways it was. Um, he says, "Yes, sir, I do." The cover of, for the cover of a horror comic, and then he describes what a cover in bad taste would be. And notice what he says here: it would be uh, holding the head a little higher so that you could see the blood dripping from it, and moving the body over further so you could see the decapitated neck. Um, and the interesting thing about what he's describing there is that's the original art to that cover. The original art to that cover was, showed both of those things. And he, as the publisher, said, no, we can't do that. We have to crop it, essentially, so that it's not so graphic. So his anger to this specific cover, especially, was, was understandable. He was self-regulating already to some degree, or at least how he perceived it to, to, to be so. And he was still being brought to trial um, uh, before the U.S. Senate to sort of defend it in some way. The, the problem with, with uh, these hearings were that they were equating all comic books with a very small, important and growing, but still a very small portion of the comic book um, area. These crime comics, these horror comics, they were becoming more popular. They were making the most money, for sure, which is one thing that scared the Senate. But, but there were still a lot of other things going on in terms of the superhero narrative, in terms of romance comics. War comics were still very big. Um, and instead, they, they looked at a, a small portion of the, of the market, said that these are not OK for our children, so therefore we, we have to throw everything out. So what came next was the Comics Code Authority. The Comic Code Authority required that this seal be on the cover of every comic book. Uh, and these are just some of the rules. Uh, so this happened in 1954, and in, so in 1954 you had these rules plus a bunch more that, w that, could, that, that went into effect. You could have no disrespect for any kind of authority. So uh, you could never p paint, for example, a policeman in a negative light. Um, you could not have excessive violence, and obviously excessive is a pretty vague term. You couldn't have monsters at all. 
uh, you could have no sexual perversion, and this was sexual perversion as it was defined by American mores in the early 1950s, which essentially just meant no sexual content whatsoever. Uh, you couldn't use specific words. Horror, terror, crime. This was the one that was meant to screw over Bill Gaines <laughs> specifically. Because William Gaines and, and EC Comics, all of their comics had those, those words in them. They essentially outlawed all of their books. William Gaines went from this to, uh, from, the, from the hearings, went directly back to his company, immediately canceled all of his books, killed the entire EC line. Um, he kept one, one comic book, and then, but, but improved it to be a magazine so it wouldn't fall under this heading, and that was Mad Magazine. That was how Mad Magazine began. Um, so that's, I guess, one good thing that came from all of this. So, and the last one is one of my favorites, Good Must Triumph Over Evil. The <laughs> um, and so what that did was it sucked all the narrative potential out of comic books as, as a rule. Things had to reset. Things had to, co to, to all end well. And what that meant was you couldn't have complex storytelling anymore. Uh, this was, you, you can't really overstate how chilling the effect of the CCA as a code really was. It was... It absolutely froze everything in time and sort of took it back to a time, a more innocent time that never really existed. It, 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 it ruined, in a lot of ways, what was happening, the good things that were happening in comic book narrative at the time. It pulled narrative completely out of the mainstream and, and sort of artificially juvenilized it, in a way. But it took a long, excuse me, it took a long time to, to fix. Um, the, just as a, as a kind of metaphor for this, if you think back to 1990 when um, television uh, handled the, um, uh, the, uh, the Children's Television Act um, that basically kind of covered how TV shows would, would address children directly, what they could and could not do in, t in children's television, how much they had to have per week in terms of children's viewing. If you think about it in, the, in, in terms of what the CCA did to comic books and transferred that over to television, it's like if, if in 1990, instead of just saying you have to show us five hours of children's um, entertainment per week, instead if they just said all TV has to now be okay for a five-year-old to watch. Wow. That's essentially what they did with comic books during this period of time. And it took a long time for that to recover. Silver Age comes along, and this is where they start trying to figure out how uh, the, the medium deals with this first blow to it. Um, the first two couple of uh, comic books in the Silver Age, uh, showcase number four, The Flash comes back. Later on in the Silver Age, we get um, the Marvel Re Revolution, where Marvel Comics comes out and really discovers a new way to create complex storylines. In the early Silver Age, the, uh, the, the, the reaction to uh, the Comic Code Authority was to make everything sort of, like I said, juvenilized. Um, it was very oversimplified. This is, why, this is why Superman started to have all the powers that he would come to have. He started to have ridiculous powers like super landscaping. <laughs> um, super weaving is one. This is his super sneezing. Anything that Superman did was, was super, and that was, that it was because they had no way to address real story, real narrative anymore. You couldn't have a real story, so instead we have, this is why most of Superman's adventures in the early Silver Age are him trying to protect his, his identity from being discovered by Lois Lane or Jimmy Olsen. These were simplified, these were innocent, these didn't have to worry, he didn't have to worry about, you know, Superman killing anybody. He just wanted to not be discovered as Clark Kent for a while. Batman, similarly, a very street level kind of guy, went from killing people, snapping their necks, um, fighting crime, to going to alien worlds, meeting Batmite, and getting married in an imaginary story. And, the, and it, it deserves mention now that the imaginary story, which seems like a redundancy in comic books because they're all imaginary stories, but the imaginary story was born in the Silver Age during this period because it was the one place where you could do something bizarre, like have Batman get married, or have Robin die, or have Superman get exiled to another world without it really be, ha, me, meaning anything, because it was an imaginary story. And so at the end, it was sort of a what if this happened. 
and you could go back to normal continuity for the next issue and it was all fine. It was one of the first stabs at trying to remature the medium. Then comes the Marvel Revolution. Marvel comes about and says, okay, if we can't have violence, if we can't have mature narrative in an external sort of way, Marvel says, we're going to internalize that strife now. We're going to start telling stories where there are flaws that are inherent in the superheroes themselves. And that was really the strategy that, that Marvel Comics started with. You have Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, Avengers, X-Men. These were all very conflicted, very flawed superheroes. Spider-Man um, gets uh, picked on uh, on the right over here. He's asking this girl for a date. He's a nerd. He doesn't get any attention. He's sad. And in this way, this internal conflict is something that readers could narratively connect with. It was a problem that wasn't banned by the Comics Code Authority. It was a problem that superheroes in this new narrative could have and be not only um, dramatic, so there was dramatic potential again in the narrative, but also as a side benefit, a big one I would argue, um, they were more sympathetic to audiences because they were more like us. So Superman, or I'm sorry, Spider-Man is a geek who can't get a date. Um, Hulk and Thor and Iron Man are these superpowered guys who go around bickering with each other and starting fights with one another like they're on a playground. The thing on, tie up, on, on top there is ashamed of the way he looks. Um, it keeps going on and on like this. Uh, Daredevil, superhero Daredevil um, is blind um, and has those challenges. Um, there were a, tons, a ton of different examples of how these, uh, these characters in Marvel specifically were allowed to be more emotionally um, complex. This is the beginnings of how uh, comics are making their way out of that CCA. This was a video, but it's not working, so that's just a nice black bo box right now. <laughs> this was, what this was was a clip from the Batman TV show, but DC's reaction to Marvel's greater complexity it was, was to re-embrace the campiness of the medium at first. So they allowed ABC Television to start the Batman TV show. You know, the, no, 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 that. Yeah. I'll be my own clip now. Um, the, uh, uh, so the Batman TV show came about as a direct response to Marvel's greater complexity. DC allowed themselves to be sort of made more innocent on television. And that, again, was a big blow in terms of the public image of superheroes, that they were campy and they were goofy and they were not serious. It took a long time for the, for the public to get over that perception as well. And it was only really into the Bronze Age when um, TV shows like The Hulk and Wonder Woman were a little bit more realistic at least and started to dis dispel some of that. The other thing that DC, when they saw that the camp wasn't working, they tried to go more modern with one of their major characters, characters Wonder Woman, um, and uh, really just sort of messed her up as well. DC was struggling a lot in this era to try to figure out where they were going to stand in this new narrative scheme. The narrative effect of the Silver Age was that it was starting to ref uh, reflect a growing sentiment in modern culture that, the, that, that fantasy could borrow from reality in, and be taken seriously in some really important ways. The Lord of the Rings series, for example, even though it was written before, didn't really take on serious literary cred until the mid-60s. And that, that's because this was around the time when we as a culture, as in American culture, started taking fantasy as serious potential literature, right? And we have Twilight Zone and Star Trek, which had... Um, uh, Twilight Zone obviously was a lot earlier. Star Trek in the late 60s was a lot more, a much better example of, of the, the culture starting to really take on um, the, the, just how serious these stories could be, to the point where uh, Star Trek, for example, ha had a ton of fans, one of whom was uh, uh, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., um, and uh, who, who thought it was a, a grand um, sort of gesture towards the civil rights movement that you had Lieutenant Uhura, who was third in command of the Enterprise, and that was, that was a huge step socially, right? So, the Silver Age starts to take on some of these social issues. It starts to take itself more seriously. Marvel is a big part of that. DC sort of starts to figure that out. The Bronze Age starts in 1970 with a couple of things. Number one, the comics code gets relaxed um, and allows mo a lot more violence, uh, a little more sex, which is where you get the, the Conan the Barbarian comics from. I'll come back to that in a second. 
It also relaxes its stance on monsters, which allows DC to start its uh, horror line up again. Um, uh, and this is the first issue of Swamp Thing coming in, skulking in the background there. Um, this this Bronze, Age, Bronze Age switch in the comics code was brought about really because of um, Marvel's pushing of the boundaries of what was appropriate and what could be done in the Silver Age. So by the time the early 70s comes around, we've got a lot of, a lot of these old walls starting to come down. A lot of them had to do with drugs. Drugs were a major issue in the early 70s. And uh, in um, early on in the 70s, we had this issue of Spider-Man. Stan Lee, creator Stan Lee, was actually approached by the U.S. government of uh, public safety to do a series of stories about drugs. And he said, at first he said, I can't, they won't let me. The Comics Code Authority won't let me do that. And the government said, don't worry about them, we'll take care of it. And so he just said, he went ahead and, 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 and did a three-issue a three series on um, the perils of drugs. And this, this series, which you'll notice doesn't have the Comics Code Authority on the cover, they refused to approve it and Marvel published it anyway with the promise from the US government that there would be no repercussions. And there weren't. There was nothing actually happened. But this is the first issue. This right here was the first issue to not carry the Comics Code since 1954. Um, later on, uh, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series went one step further and not only had uh, a, a kind of a minor character uh, having a drug problem, but this is Green Arrow's former sidekick, um, whose name is ironically Speedy, um, who is a heroin addict uh, in, this, um, in this issue. But th these were huge departures. These were directly against what the Comics Code had, had, had been only a few years before. This is, again, the medium starting to re-embrace this, this complexity, this emotional maturity, um, and to some degree, uh, a measure of, of the reality in society around it. There's still a lot of fear in the industry, even in with Marvel, about what they could get away with. This is from issue 121 of The Amazing Spider-Man. This is the death of Gwen Stacy which is looked upon as, to some uh, people as really the, the true end of the Silver Age, when, when, uh, when Gwen Stacy, who is Peter Parker, Spider-Man's girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, um, is killed. <coughs> the thing that I want to point out here is that she, she, Green Goblin pushes her off the bridge, uh, Spider-Man shoots down a web and picks her up, and here you see this little snap right there. That's incredibly important. Later on, Green Goblin, who uh, comes out you know, from this sort of um, expository narrative tradition, talks about how he's responsible for killing her. A fall from that height would kill anyone before they struck the ground. He, you didn't do it, in other words. He's giving Peter Parker an out, which is nice of him. But it's pretty clear from the art here that She's falling, he shoots his web straight down after her, and the, the, the impact of the sudden stop jerks her neck back, and she snaps her neck. It's pretty clear from the art that Spider-Man killed her, even if Green Goblin later narratively says, no, that wasn't you. She was dead before she hit the ground. So this is a, a good example of this transition time, where narrative is moving from a more innocent time in this sort of stuttering step towards more emotional maturity. Spider-Man is, is essentially uh, responsible for killing his girlfriend, but the, the story tries to give it, uh, itself an out, just in case there was an uproar about it. So, there wasn't an uproar about it. I mean, there was an uproar in terms of the fans of the comic book, because it was the first time that uh, a character of this import had been killed uh, in a comic book. It was really the first time that it happened in any major way. So it was huge, but it wasn't looked upon negatively. Then we come to Wolverine, who took over comic books, has since taken over comic books. Um, Wolverine uh, is a response to a lot of things um, in comic books, but it's, uh, for our purposes in this talk, it's really a response to how comic books are trying to reintegrate themselves into narrative as a, a, a media whole, right? Wolverine, specifically, is a direct uh, descendant of two different figures. One was the success of the Conan the Barbarian book. Conan the Barbarian is um, sort of a violent loner who wa wanders the earth doing good for good's own sake and killing people along the way to do it. Um, and that's pretty much what Wolverine is. 
Wolverine's pretty much just Conan Part 2. The look of Wolverine came directly from Dirty Harry, which was a movie uh, that had come out a few years before. This is comic books really trying to reintegrate itself into this national media. Um, it's still mirroring. It's still not inventing anything quite yet. It doesn't have the power to do it yet. Nothing's looking at com comic books for a sort of lead in, this, in, this, in the narrative medium yet. Um, but it is trying to catch up. It's trying to catch up. Also, in the Bronze Age and moving on um, into the late 70s, early 80s, there's a lot of um, uh, social justice in narrative that becomes more and more and more important. In the 1970s, that meant a lot of civil rights stuff, uh, a lot of racial integration stuff, and so that was very paramount. The X-Men uh, are pretty well known to be a civil rights metaphor um, themselves with Professor X as the MLK figure, uh, with Magneto um, as the uh, more militant um, uh, Malcolm X figure. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of social justice things, stuff going on. This is, again, how uh, comic books are looking at the world at large, adopting that narrative, infusing it into what they're trying to do, and giving it sort of a superhero spin. At the, towards the end of the uh, 80s, in 78, we had Superman the movie come out. A couple years later, we had Superman 2 come out. These were really good indicators of how far comic books had come back. They're pretty mature for where they're placed within the Bronze Age. There's a lot that's going on. There's a lot of emotional complexity. Um, there's, a lot, uh, there's a stab back at a little bit of, of violence. At the end of Superman 2, he lets uh, the evil Kryptonians just sort of fall into chasms and die. Um, and we don't mind that. That's fine. At that point in our history, we're fine. Um, the, there's a couple of Silver Age nods, including in Superman 2, where he splits into good Superman and bad Superman. That, that whole concept is very Silver Age. It goes back to a, a couple of very specific stories back in the Silver Age. But generally speaking, Superman is this watershed mark in pop culture where pop culture is starting to recognize that comic books are a big deal in, in terms of narrative, that they have an effect. Um, and it's borrowing from its entire history to put together this new uh, mythology, right? The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that, that the, a lot of those old aspects are still surviving. Superman in, in the movies is beyond hugely powerful. He turns back the planet to turn back time to save Lois Lane, which is completely non, well, nonsensical, really. You can't do that. Um, but you, it, it also doesn't even come from the comics. The movies made that up completely, right? Um, so, it's a, it's a good amalgam of all that's come before, but it doesn't really go into where it's going to go. The modern age is where it's going, and the modern age is, um, has a lot to do with uh, three different aspects that kind of come together at the same time. There's a lot of argument within the, the comic book community saying that the modern age, there's a lot of different ages, everyone always argues about what age is what. Um, and I think a lot of the confusion comes in that, that the modern age, which started in 1986, arguably, because of a couple of these books. Dark Knight Returns uh, and Watchmen both were released in, the in 1986. These were the watershed parts, the, the positive effect of the, of the new modern age. Um, these had to do with uh, the, the Batman story is kind of a dystopian look at Batman as a character. Um, he's coming back to the world ten years later. Uh, the Christopher Nolan movies borrowed from this to some degree. Uh, Watchmen is, is probably regarded as one of, one of the, if not the, uh, best example of comic book narrative that we have. Um, it's a, a limited series that began in, in 1986. They both sort of look at a logical extension of that Bronze Age uh, question about what, how do we integrate reality with these, these fantasy concepts. These are sort of, if this really was real, if we really did have superheroes, Watchmen asks, where, how far would that go? Um, and so, and the movie that came out a few years ago is a pretty good ad adaptation of that, I, for my money. Um, other positive aspects of the modern age, Sandman, Neil Gaiman's Sa Sandman, fantastic, out of continuity, but, but amazing. Starman, James Robinson's Starman, also very nostalgic, sort of look back at comic books as they've come along. The modern age is, in comic books and narrative, is actually very postmodern because it's very much about itself. It's, it's, it's comic books looking back at itself and saying, here's what we were, here's, here's sort of the questions that, that rise from where this narrative has come from. 
Um, okay. That then leads to the Batman movies, um, which were awesome in a number of ways, but um, the, specifically in terms of narrative, it was amazing, I think, to me and to a lot of other fans that uh, they not only were as goofy as they were able to be, but they took themselves seriously at the same time. And that, that sense of serious goofiness was really indicative of where comic books were at the time, especially, right? It poked fun at itself to some degree, but it was also, I mean, in a lot of ways, really, I mean, if you look at Jack Nicholson's portrayal of the Joker, it's pretty vile. He does a really good job of being an awful human being uh, in that role, which is exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And despite the fact that every fan was like, Michael Keaton can't be Batman because he was Mr. Mom and whoever else. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, it, the, it, again, that worked, and it was had to do a lot to do with Tim Burton's vision of that, and how that darkness integrated with that, with the realism and narrative and superhero na narrative. Okay, so that's the good side of the modern era. The bad side of the modern era. This is where narrative really stalls out again. It stalled out first with the CCA and the code and Wortham's seduction of the innocent. Now again, it stalls out in two different ways, and they both have to do with money. Um, in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, a couple of things were starting to brew. The first is speculation. People are starting to realize that comic books are going to be worth money. Remember back at the beginning of the talk and I, when I said that you know, Action Comics number one worth, you know, sells over for over $2 million. That started to become apparent back in uh, the late 80s that people were starting to pay serious money for old comic books. So people started to buy comic books not because they wanted to read them but because they wanted to invest in them. That brought about a huge surplus of comics, and, and, that, and that brought out a, a huge uh, plummet in uh, their, their, uh, their value, um, but also in, in how good they became. You can't put out that much product and keep up quality control, frankly. Wizard was a magazine um, in the early 90s forward that just went defunct a couple years ago. It honestly very much uh, involved in the downfall uh, and the, uh, of the comic book in terms of its upswing and marketability. Wizard Magazine was all about marketing comic books. It wasn't about actually respecting them for the form, ultimately. So, that, so the speculation boom was one problem. The other problem was image comics. In 1992, a bunch of artists defected from Marvel because they wanted to own their own characters. Um, Rob Liefeld uh, and... Um, Todd McFarlane were two of them. These are the, they're the books that they put out under the new image banner. They started a new company under themselves so they could own their own product. That sounds fine. The problem was that, this, that everybody who defected from Marvel were all artists. They weren't writers. And so all these guys thought they could write a story because they knew how to draw well. And that's not the case at all. So we have this image era that's full of really beautifully drawn, completely empty stories. <laughs> and people bought them en masse for a long, long time, far longer than any of us should have. Spawn number one, um, <coughs> excuse me, for example, uh, sold millions of copies. Um, it, it is by far, um, I think the official number is like 1.7 million copies. At that number, it is by far the, the, the most widely printed comic book uh, from an independent company like Image, um, still to this day. The, the problem is that at the same time, people were buying those sometimes 10 or 20 at a time because they were convinced that in a couple years, this is going to be worth hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, and they would clean up. And now you can find that comic for like a dollar, a lot of places. They're, they're just not worth very much. Um, and it, but it all has to do with these two new parts of the modern age, the speculation and the art, sort of artist as superstar, as exemplified by Image Comics, that where, again, narrative took a back seat. Story isn't as important. It's all about the art, it's all about the money, and story sort of falls away. This was a huge, a huge setback to, not, to narrative comics until what I'm calling the comic book renaissance, um, which started in 2001 with September 11th. The response to uh, September 11th, 2001 was huge in comic books. Um, and it did one really amazing thing um, 
which was to sort of make heroism for heroism's sake cool again. Um, patriotism also, huge upswing, American patriotism. And so you have a character like Captain America who was very much a nobody throughout the 80s and 90s. He was around, but he wasn't popular. Nobody cared about him. He was kind of a joke. He was very often made fun of by other characters in the stories because he was sort of archaic and patriotism was sort of funny. Um, all of a sudden, uh, September 11th happens and patriotism isn't funny anymore to us as a culture. Captain America becomes a much bigger character. And, and we still see the after effects of that today. Captain America is as big as he is as a character now directly lead, heading back to this to that day. Um, along the same lines, you also had Spider-Man the movie come out. This was again, just like Superman the movie, just like Batman, Spider-Man comes out and it is a huge watershed in how the public perceives comic book narrative. It's no longer just funny, dismiss, easily dismissed stuff. It's actually serious stuff and it's things that, it's a story that they could go to the movies and enjoy themselves. It's not just kid stuff, it's not just you know, the, the interesting thing about this uh, specific Spider-Man, by the way, um, is this is the recalled poster uh, because you can see the Twin Towers reflected in his, in his eye. Um, and they recalled this poster because, because this, this poster came out about a month or two before the disasters, the end of that summer of 2001. Um, see, it says coming 2002 at the bottom. So they recalled that there was a scene originally in it where he strings a web between the Twin Towers. That was more evidently the Twin Towers in the original cut. Um, so again, 9-11 has a huge impact on it. And, and moving forward, story becomes even more paramount. Once again, we, we kind of leave the image era behind and we're moving into this new era of narrative where story starts to really make a difference. And you can see the after effects in every company. This isn't just... Uh, Marvel and DC, even Image, which are the two on the right here, start to really embrace the importance of narrative. So story comes back full force. You've got Ultimate Spider-Man, the Civil War miniseries, um, Brian Bendis' Daredevil, Ed Brubaker's Captain America, uh, Grant Morrison's Batman, so on and so forth, and then Walking Dead, which is one of the biggest success stories in comic books um, uh, in the last few years at least. Uh, in terms of how massively popular that, um, that TV series continues to be. And that began as an, as an image comic. Um, and it was one of the first image comics, along with Astro City, which is, a, which is really good too, um, that really re-embraced story. They were saying, okay, enough of this nothing but art stuff. Okay, this is my last awesome clip. Um, but this is... This is, uh, this is just, this was a really quick one, and it was from Christopher Nolan's Batman, and it really, I, I, I chose it because I wanted to show um, how even in modern narrative, we're still kind of hearkening back to this um, code authority era that didn't actually exist. So Batman, in the third Batman movie, um, is fighting alongside Catwoman, and he kicks, uh, he roundhouse kicks a gun out of her hands to, to stop her from shooting one of the bad guys that they're in the middle of pummeling, because pummeling is better than shooting. Um, and so, uh, and he says to her, no guns, no killing. Right? And, and then she says, what's the fun in that? Because she's the anti-hero. So, uh, but then, as the movie progresses, you could actually make a body, I didn't do this, but it'd be fun to, to do, watch the movie and make a, and have a running count of how many people Batman is at least indirectly responsible for killing. Um, and it would be up there. So it's kind of an arbitrary rule, but it harkens back to that imaginary narrative from the early years in the golden age when, when uh, or supposedly, when, when, when Batman didn't kill people, even though he did. It's still that remnant of the uh, code authority coming forward and saying, Batman's a good guy, therefore he has to at least espouse the belief that we do not kill people. That, even, even in the movie though, it, it, it gets undercut because later in the movie, Catwoman comes back and as Batman's getting pounded into dust by Bane, she shoots him and saves him. And so the lesson for that, and then she says something like, that whole no guns thing, I'm not so much into that. And, and that's like her moment where, where, we, where, where the, the, the narrative is actually recognizing that it's sort of full of crap, right? That this, 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 this rule doesn't really, we, give it, we pay it lip service, heroes tend to pay it lip service, it's part of what we think of when we think of the hero narrative, 
but it's not really there and it never really has been. Um, the by any means necessary rule has been there from the very beginning. We pretended for a long time that it wasn't. Um, and that's one of the ways that narrative has progressed. It's a lot of talking about one black box, but... Uh, so then comic narrative all of a sudden explodes um, in this sort of what I'm calling the Renaissance in a, a bunch of different ways. And the interesting thing about this is that now comic books are starting to show up in other sources. Comic books are no longer the, uh, mirroring pop culture. Things, pop culture is starting to mirror comic books. That's a huge switch and it's never really happened before. There have been a few times, like with the, a few TV series, the Batman series, Hulk in the 70s, Wonder Woman in the 70s, so on and so forth, where they've borrowed from that, from that to some degree. But really, we're in an era where comic books are important in the overall narrative of culture like never before. The fact that a book about comic books could win the Pulitzer Prize for Michael Chabon is, is, is astounding. The fact that we, we watch films, the, the biggest films, the most money-making films in recent years have all been comic book movies. Uh, the fact that, and then you look at uh, a movie like, uh, uh, like The Cabin in the Woods, Joss Whedon's Cabin, The Cabin in the Woods, and this is sort of a deconstruction. That movie is a deconstruction of all the horror tropes that came out of those comic books in the 50s and forward and, and puts them all to this deconstructive use and sort of says, here's all of our stories. Here's all the stuff we've come up with and, and, and creates this new narrative from it. It's, it's pretty exciting stuff. It's, it's amazing that we've gone from being absolutely inconsequential to being absolutely vilified, this is as a medium, to, be, to being um, artificially juvenilized and then, and then slowly crawling out of that narrative hole bit by bit by bit. Um, and, and finally, I think we're at the point where, uh, where, where it's all starting to, to start taking itself more seriously. And in the end, the comic narrative grows up and we see this new sort of re-embracing of where it began, this sort of dark Superman that people are starting to talk about for this for Man of Steel, which is coming out this next year. Um, everyone's talking about how this might be dark, this, this could be, uh, is this Superman? And I think it absolutely is Superman. Superman started by starting, you know, starting fires and then saying, run away. Um, the, <laughs> This is, this is sort of going back to its roots, but it's also this, a really strong embracing of narrative and, and understanding that we can have um, complex emotional ties to these superhero narratives and that it really isn't just kid stuff anymore. That's all I got. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I was trying to go fast. But I think we have some time if anybody uh, has some questions. Do you mind? I don't mind at all. Yeah. Okay, well, I just have a quick question. Yeah. What is one of your favorite comic book series? Oh, wow. I have so many. No. Um, uh, well, I was talking with Nick earlier. and uh, I, I have complete runs of both Amazing Spider-Man and Avengers from the very beginning because I love them so much. I'm very much a Marvel guy because that was just the era that I grew up in. DC was not as mature, at the, not, not that I was mature because I was six, but still. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I love those very much. I, I'm, uh, and, and I still love rereading some of the, um, those classic arcs. Those are some of my favorites for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think that that was sort of the beginning of that maturation process where it was, and, and that's, but that's, it, it wasn't anything new. We've had TV adaptions, adaptations in, uh, in comic books for a long time. You can look back in the 60s and there were Lost in Space comics and uh, there were um, Green Hornet comics before that and there were, a lot of these were very, they shared that media to some degree. But they were always sort of juvenilized. What you, those you're talking about, especially the Buffy comics, were purposefully very, they took themselves very seriously. They, were, they, they really worked to be, uh, to be complex emotional narratives in a sense that was uh, of literary import to some degree. Joss Whedon is, uh, I mean, you know, he's one of those guys that all comic book geeks sort of want to be. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and, and, and those, are, those are the guys who, the exciting thing about, for me about the industry right now is it's kind of full of those guys who grew up with this respect for the medium, in a sense, and who now are creating stuff of their own and can bring that to the table, right? These weren't people that, that were brought up on this more innocent time where comic books were silly. These were guys who were brought up when comic books were doing edgy stuff. When, um, I mean, one of them, uh, this is sort of ancillary to the comic book thing, but you know, with J.J. Abrams doing the new Star Wars movie, the fact that, the, that Abrams and guys like him all point to The Empire Strikes Back, which is far more complex uh, a, a narrative, um, as, as source material, as inspiration, le leads me to hope that it's not going to suck. <laughs> right? So, I mean, the, yeah, that, that whole idea of, of the mediums borrowing from each other, I think, is a really big indicator of where it was starting to go. I think so. I think so. I mean, there, there are things that each narrative can, can do better than the other. Uh, and so, all that, it's, it's sort of that additive experience. Um, the, I, I have a friend of mine who, um, a huge Firefly fan, you know, has read all the stuff that's out there to read, has seen them all, uh, you know, a bunch of times. Um, and, and, and he could probably do this entire thing on just Firefly and how awesome it is. But, um, but I think that complexity comes through that, the, the mixing of the media. For sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, I could. Um, if you have another hour, we could do that. Um, briefly, I think that the, uh, um, early on, the, the mediums were so raw uh, and the artistic styles were so raw. It's, 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 it's hard sometimes to remember that like these characters when they were developed weren't developed in a cohesive way. Um, so Superman's uh, origin story, Batman's origin story, didn't necessarily come about in full bloom until much later on and when they, when they kind of had two pages to fill and so they decided to do an origin story. So a lot of this stuff developed slowly over time. The artistic styles I think really reflect over, over time how um, the sort of the maturing of the narratives as well because I think Arguably, um, you have like a Kirby effect back in the 60s and 70s, which is very like action, active and very um, dynamic. I mean, incredible style. Um, but but today is a, it feels a little more static. We have this sort of image era where it was all pretty, and now we have this sort of combination era now in terms of the art where you have dynamic plus pretty, um, and and that's sort of where we are now. The medium, I think, is, 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 has made a di big difference in terms of how uh, we see uh, comic books um, as a thing. We went from, that new, from newsprint, the really cheap newsprint, um, to now we have glossy stock and it's incredibly expensive comparatively because of it. So there's been a lot of changes over time that have affected the way we read that medium. But yeah, that's a good question. I'll need a lot more time to answer it fully. <laughs> so kind of going along with that, do you think, like, for instance, I have on my iPad the Marvel app right now, and mm -hmm. I purchase comics in that yeah. fashion? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that's really going to take hold like it has with e-books, or do you think people are still going to keep I really hope. I, I don't know. I, I'm all for the medium. I'm all for the medium uh, existing no matter in what form. Right. Um, but at the same time, if, if there comes a day when they no longer print them in, real, in the real world, I'll be very sad. Um, and honestly, I think m I, m I, as a collector, will use that as a jumping off point for the first time ever in my entire life, where I've always ignored the jumping off points in terms of collecting. But um, uh, I, I think at that point, I might kind of keep an eye on, like, what's Spider-Man doing now? But I won't, I won't collect them anymore. Right. Because there's no thing. There's not, yeah. Not you know, there's, <laughs> yeah, there's nothing that I can put in a bag and go and visit once in a while. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think I have, I have really mixed feelings about sort of all of it going electronic. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure at all that um, it won't happen, though. I'm afraid that it will. It's gonna, it's, I think if, if it goes that direction, my guess is that we won't have continuity at all anymore. And, and we'll go back to um, a model that's a lot more like um, 
small uh, limited series arcs um, and, and that, that will be out of continuity. I think the actual living continuity of the comic book at that point may die. Like that's just my guess. That's what they're doing. They're small arcs. They don't sell. Like, yeah, they, 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 even in the regular series, that's what they're doing now. Yeah, because they want to put them into, they want six issue series so they can put this into a trade paperback, sell that, and then, yeah. I think that's sort of the way it's going, which again is kind of sad because continuity is one of the ways that people get hooked in. Um, and if there's no reason to follow the continuity, there's not going to be as much of a reason to keep buying the things. You, you, or you could find a serial, serialized way to do that. In other words, you could, you could do a longer narrative that takes lots of, for lack of a better term, installments. Yeah. And just dispense them out in sort of pez like fashion. And, yeah. You know, but I know what you mean, because it's what I do with music now. So I used to look forward to the album. Right. And, you know, you'd have the album. Right, right. And, the actual and, work. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. very and there's a lot of. Yeah, and there's a lot of esoterics that you lose in, in in the digitalization of that because in just like with 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 record albums, you used to have you know the cover art and the liner notes and uh, the jacket and there's all these different like modes of communication. Same with CDs, same thing with comic books as a medium. You have the advertisements, and I mean one of the things that. Um, when I was doing pop culture writing, I would go back sometimes to these these ads that that were ubiquitous in in comic books specifically, and like uh, but magazines too in the 70s and 80s, like Hostess fruit pie ads were absolutely everybody knew exactly what those were, but without the comic book as medium, they wouldn't exist. So if you have a digital form where you don't have advertising anymore or don't have advertising in the same way, you lose that point of reference culturally, which kind of sucks. You, I think you're going to lose something no matter what, if if it goes fully online. Yes, ma'am. Which one? Man of Steel. It's yeah. There's still a couple of comic, of Superman comic books. They and but that's going to be that's the movie that's coming out this summer. It's sort of based on the comic book. We have yet to see exactly how much the script go, goes off the comic book. But it's, they're kind of rebooting the series. There was that Superman movie a few years ago, um, and it had problems. It had issues, and then uh, and and now they're kind of re rebooting it. They're starting it over again. So we'll see. I'm hoping it's not terrible. That's always the fan hope. Please let it not be terrible. Can you talk about the video game um, as a medium? Uh, I'm just curious to what extent this has transferred over. I really don't. Comic books have been, tr they've tried to transfer um, the comic book uh, narrative over to video games for a long time. I think we're just reaching the point now where the narratives are complex enough to actually hold them. Um, the powers are still a problem though. Having a, having a, a character as, as powerful as Superman, for example, even just simply the power of flight puts another dimension into a video game that it doesn't really have to, have to necessarily do work with. Um, so I mean, there, you know, there's a there's a massive multi uh, multiplayer online game for both for DC. There's ones coming out for Marvel, I think. Um, uh, the ones that I know most about are sort of um, my daughters actually play the the um, the Lego Batman series, and in, and then in the new one of that, they have all these different DC characters, and it's interesting to see how they portray because it's kind of cheesy. It's a little funny. It's meant they play them for humor, and so Batman, sort of this ridiculously dark, sort of grim, grunting sort of hero, and Superman is this sort of, like I said at the beginning, this Boy Scout sort of doofus who sort of goes in and busts things over and 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 fixes problems by tearing down slums, for example. So the 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 video game response to superhero as narrative, I I really think with games like. Um, uh, uh, like the uh, like the Red Dead Redemption and, and these massive storylines um, in video games, it's really just starting to approach where you could actually play a comic book all the way through. I think the Batman um, couple of games that were out for Batman for the for the um, the Xbox, I think, and those those have a really solid narrative and they borrow pretty nicely from it. But it's all it's very much like that limited series. It's nothing it's nothing really in continuity, um, and so they'd have to come out with a different kind of game in order to reflect the continuity that they've built up, which would be kind of cool. That may be where it goes next. I don't know. That would be cool. I'd never leave the, whole, the house. I'd, <laughs> that'd be it for me. Yeah. <laughs>
Thank you very much, everybody.